this is a very um, strange one. Um, when I was 18 years old, I went and I had a Mohican hairstyle and I moved from Newcastle and I went to Leeds University and I studied English. And my first, the first tutor lecturer that I liked was Dr. Lynette Hunter. And she taught me um, literary theory, semiotics, structuralism, that kind of thing. And we just kind of drifted apart as students and lecturers do. And then it turns out she's she's a, a, an internal martial artist and she's combined, she's combined martial arts and, and performance and rhetoric studies now. And she's in Canada and it's Lynette Hunter and I'm talking to my old time favorite ever teacher. Lynette, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Paul. Yeah, one of my all time favorite students, um, but no longer a student. Somebody is teaching me things. So it's great the way that that works and it turns around and it goes around. Yeah, it was so it was such a strange thing. So I did I did all of my degrees in Leeds. I did English and then I switched departments to do cultural studies, MA. And then when I registered to do when I started my PhD, I saw an announcement for your George Orwell conference. And I gave my first ever paper, like first ever presentation uh, in, in your, your conference. And then when I put up a flag and announced my first ever attempt to publish anything called martial arts studies, you popped back up again. And this time you were in California, you were a distinguished professor of rhetoric or something in, uh, in University of California, Davis. And you just, and it's just amazing the way that, that, that our relationship is kind of, lasted so long and, and had so many different forms. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? I think it's partly that kind of base ground of thinking about philosophical issues in the critical theory area it, or, or any kind of really serious rhetoric. Uh, it goes, it sort of morphs into whatever it is that you're looking at and uh, connects people. So, so tell us about about you so when 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 i met you you were teaching um english language and literature and, and kind of literary theory but you always identified with rhetoric at that time you were a, you were yeah. like a lecturer or reader in rhetoric so what's yeah. the and, and were you were you doing martial artsy things then or did that grow later uh i was just about to um i started off as a scientist a biochemist and uh, then i moved into um English literature and that morphed into rhetoric and um, the way that rhetoric does it morphed into a whole series of different kinds of things uh, like women's studies and cultural studies and that kind of thing but um, just before we met up at Leeds as in that in that situation in the English department I had started um, I had been mentored by um, a Blackfoot Sioux woman who was part of the Leeds Calgary Exchange, uh, a First Peoples scholar from um, a place called Lethbridge in Alberta, and started getting really interested in indigenous knowledge and philosophy. So through the 90s, um, when I, uh, I, I, I came across a system that I trained in for many years in uh, what do you call it? You call it martial arts, um, or and I guess I would possibly call it internal martial arts, but I don't like the word martial, okay. so I don't actually ever use that. Um, uh, the, the the kind of connections between indigenous philosophy and the way in which reciprocity and respect feed into a lot of the relationships between people and people and animals and people and landscapes um i found themselves being paralleled in what i was learning in the uh, system of it's actually called a um, a whole body breeding practice a taoist whole body breeding practice but of course it it has elements um that one would associate with a whole range of uh, martial arts mm -hmm. so i started I was doing those things sort of simultaneously through throughout the 90s and um, and then when I went to California I uh, there was no longer any need for me to be teaching first people's materials because I was surrounded by first peoples and so I didn't do that anymore but I spent a lot of time developing 
um, ways to teach undergraduates some of the principles, or I would call it a state of mind, really, um, that I had appreciated and learned uh, through um, this Taoist whole body breathing practice that I was working on. Yeah. And I've just continued doing it. I've, I've got a range of people who I work with and who have taught me, and I'm extremely grateful to all of them. Um, and it's it's just built up in a way that is not really book based, but is definitely based on person to person transmission, oral transmission, physical transmission, energy transmission. Okay, I mean, I I remember when I was um, when I was doing my PhD, and that was probably the only time in my life I wasn't doing martial arts really because I just I, I just I was totally consumed by by scholarship but you actually gave me like a printout like a raw like a big ream of a4 you gave it to me of of your book about situated um textualities and it was all about and, and it was about you know computing and the arts and 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 i read that so i read the whole book i never ever had a page reference for anything because you'd given me the, the just just but um and it was always really hard to quote from it by I, so I had to quote from it very vaguely just re reference to it but it was it was interesting because it was one of the probably one of the most influential books that I read when I was doing my PhD and interestingly probably unconsciously or consciously determined by the fact I knew I was speaking to you today I actually referenced it again today when I was I was working on um, I'm, I was kind of combining the philosophy of um, Peter Sloterdijk with with kind of martial arts because he's all about you must change your life. It's about fitness and training. It's kind of Foucauldian, and he talks about kind of values. The way you used to talk about the the internal tautologies of value, like within a practice, like you don't really interrogate why you love literature you don't really interrogate why you love martial arts because you just get to a tautology like it's important because it's important right and viewed from the outside no one would understand that so like we all live in these little worlds these little language games these practice mm -hmm. games that make absolute sense to us but if we get pushed on them Mm. can't really define it more than like what Richard Rorty used to call final vocabulary. It's like, I can't say anything more about this than it's important. I mean, do you still buy yeah. into that kind of idea? Would you still say that? Or is there a different way of expressing value to someone who doesn't intuitively get why literature or internal breathing exercises or, or, or rhetoric is, is important? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think you have to understand that as the way that most discourse works. Most, most of us work that way in, I, I, have a, I have a kind of way of talking about it that says you've got to be able to buy your toothpaste. Okay. So you buy into a capitalist system with neoliberal things that you don't really agree with, but you need to buy your toothpaste. Yeah. So, but at the same time, that's not why I get up in the morning. I don't get up in the morning because I want to buy my toothpaste. I get up in the morning because there are things that I need and uh, without them, life really wouldn't be worth living. Um, and w one of the things that um, was always going on in my life was a, a sense of um, making things, having a practice that wasn't about uh, having an effect on something through the practice, but it was just doing it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I went to California, I totally by chance, the way these things happen in your life, um, I, I began to run a performance studies PhD and uh, was surrounded by some of the most amazing art makers, people with incredible practices in all sorts of different media from digital through to dance to theater to music, whatever. And um, some of the some of the questions that you've taken up, for example, how do you talk about Taekwondo or some of the people you've interviewed? How do you talk um, about various different practices in the martial arts? It, that's a kind of central question for a lot of these particular practitioners. But what they're interested in, or what I'm trying to get them to be interested in, is how do you, how do you talk about how you, um, how you practice 
rather than how you watch a performance or how you engage with something that's effective how do you engage with something that's affective and i think what's happened there for me is it's pushed me way back past uh thinking about these internal tautologies um to to places where there need to be strategies i need to have strategies for getting rid of the self getting rid of what might, some people might call the ego but i don't do much um with concepts like ego uh but but in a sense dissolving the boundaries of the self and this is something i think good martial artists probably do know um i quite like to know how what you think of a, a martial artist is you know why <laughs> you use the phrase martial artist yeah. you know uh, but but at some point i think there's a sense of the porousness of the practicing body that is no longer bounded by the skin and um something happens at that point i think there's a there's a because you're morphing with things that are not yourself the self is kind of loosed it's gone when you as a taoist would say when you differentiate yourself back into being yourself you're different you're changed and at that point you start figuring out what it is that you need about this changed self and at that point you begin to start valuing and maybe it turns into another tautology, maybe it doesn't. Mm. But the tautologies are places that, that I think my whole body breathing practice, maybe your martial art, it gives you a way of loosing and gathering, loosing and gathering that where the tautological structures that you're in just morph out. They're, they're not there anymore. They don't mm. even have any relevance really mm -hmm. because they're not discursive mm -hmm. yet so is this is this why you're interested in it, for so long you've, you've used the well a long time ago um you were using the idea of the situation it's the situation i guess rather than like an ego or a self it's like obviously when you're talking i'm thinking for me i always think about tai chi push hands which i haven't done for just far too long now but in 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 push hands it it sort of is and isn't combative and and you are kind of very much merging with someone else in a situation and a context and and i mean i do use concepts like ego but that sense that because it's that intending hoping forcing driving kind of element of yourself you have to you have to get relinquish that and something else has to come into play which is a sensual kind of um feeling technical ability that's based on on posture and and, and sort of expanding yourself mm. in someone else while without with and without losing yourself i mean is that the kind of thing that you would think now about the idea of a situation or a situated um relationship yeah i think it's actually it, uh, it actually goes further than the situated um the, the for me the situated is is simply something that that has emerged alongside discourse. The discourse doesn't really care about. The discourse doesn't even know, you know, the way that people walk past homeless people on the street and they don't see them, you know? Um, so discourse is something that um, I think doesn't really look at a lot of the things that we need in our lives, the reason that we do get up in the morning. Um, so situated, it, it, for me, the term comes from a group of uh, feminist, uh, pe feminist science and technology uh, philosophers um, like Donna Haraway, mm. yeah, and uh, it's it's something that is never completely separated from discourse. You can't do that, but it is something at the same time that discourse doesn't really care about. So if you're in the situated, you're 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 not reacting to things that happen in discourse. And I'd be very interested to see how this would play out in your idea of uh, constellations. The constellation of things that you talked about in the paper that you gave in November. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, you can talk about that in a second. <laughs> the um, when you're when you're in a situated place, you have the option of pushing things into discourse if you want to. If you think, you know, for example, there's an immediate political change that needs to happen, you might need to do that. Um, but you also don't have to do that. There is no need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it, you, it is usually predicated, the situation is usually predicated on a, on a small group of people who 
need the kind the, need the same kinds of things and mm. so they get together and they're doing these various things that they need even if nobody else is really particularly interested in them um, and I don't think that's tautological because it wouldn't keep going um, if it were tautological it would just die uh, it's got to have a way of, of moving on I think it's a continual process but if you go past that um, into into concepts that emerge through say Husserl and Heidegger into concepts of presencing then I think that you're what you where you are there is is not even in a situated place you're that's the place where I think the ego or the self or whatever can get uh, dispersed can get horrors I mean Derrida talks about it when he talks about the friend and he says you can only know the friend in death you only know your friends when they die and and partly that's um i think about the way he talks about it is that you're constantly in some kind of communication with somebody who you might call a friend and every time you meet there is some kind of change that goes on and that when they die that change doesn't happen anymore so you recognize all the changes that have happened because they're not on going anymore uh, but it's that it's that it's that continual um, change that happens and that's 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 fundamental to to um, Husserlian presencing and a lot of early phenomenology um, I think it goes even further than that in things like martial arts and this whole body breathing practice that I do because I think you go you get towards the idea of not knowing and and a kind of uh, sense sensing of nothingness which isn't an empty sense it's just it, nothingness what's nothingness I don't know that's why I use the word um, but it is something that you radically do not know you could never know it and and in that place in that space the self disintegrates in a way it, it, it the Taoist the English translation of the Taoist term is to be undifferentiated mm -hmm. and then you differentiate yourself back into yourself because you've got to buy your toothpaste yeah so it's way past the situated that a lot of this kind of stuff happens but I think the situated is an important place because political things happen there and um, politics with a small p probably but they always have the option of turning themselves toward discourse and inserting something into discourse that discourse may ignore, mm -hmm. but it may, it may find eruptive or disruptive or interesting or, you know. So, I mean, when you're talking about, you, you mentioned Taoism at the end, and I was thinking all the way through that, that I know that you have, have written about Taoism, you've, you've incorporated that, Taoist themes into your performances and so on. I mean, what did the Tao, did your interest in Taoism and the texts of Taoism and, and I guess practice practice that may be called Taoist. Did that emerge from your the, the breathing stuff that you did the the, the non martial arts um, <laughs> physical um, internal stuff that you were doing, or did it did it was it an intellectual journey? I mean, w which do you think? I don't I mean it's not it, it's a journey that's con constantly ongoing uh, the, I mean I don't really know very much about Taoism even though I've spent years trying to figure out what I do think about it um, because it's it's something that I've learned from very a very small number of basic texts um, but mainly through doing the whole body breathing practices um, and just to be clear, a lot of those practices, uh, although they are based primarily on different breathing techniques and, and then developing energy um, and, and the different kinds of energy that can be you know, surface energy, internal energy, projected energy, whatever you want, um, it, you know, these are um, put into forms. As one of my teachers, Alex Boyd, said recently, forms are there to help you uh, simply um get access to some of this and practice it and strategize with it but then you leave the forms behind and the forms include a lot of work that looks like aikido or taekwondo 
but the forms can also include and did include when I was younger a lot of things that look like jiu-jitsu or judo the forms include a lot of things that look like uh, different kinds of tai chi the forms include um, you know the, the the entire world of, of Chinese kaimen which a lot of people think of as a kind of yoga uh, which it isn't really but it could be um, uh, the Tao Yin breathing techniques. I mean, it's use of swords and sabers and sticks and silks and that kind of thing is all there. Um, and it could be martial for sure. Uh, that's why I'd like to know how you define martial arts. For me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, from from my perspective, it's, it's, it's a term that emerged historically um, really caught on in the late 60s and 70s in English and, and, and before that it was other, other there was no overarching concept in in the English language because it was a really, well, what do you think it is what do I think martial arts is I yes. think uh, I think it's an umbrella term for um, a very diverse and heterogeneous collection of, of practices potential practices um, I just think that it's it's not even a permanently set organizing term for for the field of things that we would intuitively recognize as martial arts so this is kind of stuff that that you're talking about would not necessarily be recognized by a, a lot of practitioners of what we would still call martial arts but there'd be a route into it i guess so like people like me who've spent a long time doing chinese martial arts and so-called internal martial arts like tai chi which shades into qigong would go oh yeah that's that's all that's all definitely part of it no problem there whatsoever but other people who maybe have only i don't know de dealt with mma or krav maga or something yeah. wouldn't accept that that was and that's why i think that the term has this actually although it's a, a very old term it, it's it you know you can point back to you know middle english and say it could have existed then if you wanted mm -hmm. but um but it didn't and it certainly didn't mean anything like it does now Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, Chinese people often say to me, yeah, but it's 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 uh, it's Wu Shu and that there you go. That's it. And you go, yeah, well, so why for so long was it Guo Shu or why was it different things? And why is in, in, in Hong Kong, is it Kung Fu and why is it? And because it's it's not a necessary term. It just happens mm -hmm. to be the way that that uh, these physical and technical practices yeah. have been organized yeah. into the late 60s and 70s. Thanks yeah. largely to to, um, you know, people like Bruce Lee using the term. Sure. Um, yeah. And it didn't... I, mean, the reason I, I guess the reason I'm asking is because I teach a lot of students. Um, I have a fairly large class where I teach um, a number of these different practices uh, at undergraduate level. And they come in, a lot of them, with, with exactly the kind of background that, that you personally have, have laid out uh, in terms of the history of, of British martial arts, for example. And, you know, you say the word Bruce Lee and they jump up and down and they say, yeah, that's why I'm here. Um, and they take one look at me and they say, but you're a little old lady. You can't do that kind of thing. Um, and then they or they say um, they've been watching an awful lot of uh, Star Wars, for example. Okay. You know? And where they go with that, because they need teachers and I'm often the first teacher. Um, they they go very heavy handed with it. They want it to be something that will allow them to have an effect on the world so that they become powerful. Mm -hmm. And obviously I'm, I'm all for giving people agency. And I think this does give people agency. It gives them self-confidence. It gives them the, the uh, ability to think about ways in which they can change their society, change their world. Um, but trying to move that away from being something that you do against somebody is is something that i'm dedicated to and so for me the the word martial poses some kinds of problems because they associate that with something that is very well pretty brutal and 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 actually quite negative and you probably know that mixed martial arts in the states is increasingly perceived of as a kind of white extremist activity so there's a bit of a there's a kind of uh, pedagogical edge mm. to not using the word martial mm -hmm. um, even though I know that what you're saying is absolutely right and correct in terms of cultural uh, background mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when we were trying to establish different issues to do with, say, martial arts studies around the journal, or should we have a society or a network, or what, what do we do? And I was speaking mm. to people who have theorized embodied practice and embodied, and they've lived it, and they've, they've studied it and taught it and tried to establish things. People like Ben Spatz, mm. and, he, and he, his response was, why would you want to draw a line there around a set of practices and go, this is somehow distinct from implicitly yeah. different kinds of performance studies or theater studies or, and, and it was a good question. Um, and I, I guess the answers to that would never be fully satisfactory. And you'd have to say, well, we have to draw a line somewhere around these things. And, mm -hmm. and this is how we want to demarcate it. But it would be, you know, the kind of thing that Edward Said or Stuart Hall would say, it's arbitrary where we're staking a claim to something and saying, but just th this is, but then this is why I always hesitate to, to, to define and I always try to persuade people that we don't need to define because once you start to define it has all kinds of negative effects and policing and hierarchizing and prejudicial effects so that someone might say, why is he talking to Le Lynette Hunter who's only interested in breathing and, and, and performance and rhetoric like that's not proper martial arts, but but I still think that that it's I think more in textual ways about the, the kind of the textures and kind of effective forces and relations between things. I don't mm -hmm. think of, you know, unless you're wearing a white gi and a black belt, you're not really doing martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, it's yeah. more complicated than that, but I still, I still am attached to the term. I'm kind of yes. attached to it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I was just interested. And I mean, I kind of knew the answer, mm. but uh, it's, it's important for me to get that out there. Um, and, it's it's also important for me to as a teacher to try to uh, move people on from the idea that um, martial means control over something or somebody else yeah. that's all yeah i mean i i, I don't and the, the alternative terms that are currently circulating things that people use like combat sports i don't do combat sports because i don't do sport mm -hmm. It's just yeah. I, not for me. It's not sport. Uh, I I don't. It's not really self defense because there's so much more to it than that. It's certainly not like combative in that military or kind of policing kind of thing. So I, martial arts works for me because it to me oh. it, it immediately suggests it connotes. Thinking back to my 1989 exposure yeah. to Roland Bart, it kind of doesn't denote so much as connote. It's more of a kind of mythos and a feel or a, or a or as you might say, like a topos or an ethos. It's a, yeah. the kind of context where I, I do want to train with people. And yes, I, I do want to win, but it's a very collaborative um, self-learning. You know, it, it's, it's right. I don't want, I think in combat sports, that's closer to a martial spirit in the sense of I want to beat the other person. Yeah, like, right. I, I don't go in for that. I, I've, I've rarely be in, in, entered competition. Mm -hmm. So things like well, it's an art, isn't it? I mean, the nice thing about it is that it's an art, or a set of arts, and yeah. you know you don't you don't beat people in that way, because yeah. if you did, then the performance would fail. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is the uh, for a, for a good few years I did train in a style that was particularly kind of aggressive and, and brutal, and it was all about well, you want to you know want to make them unconscious as soon as possible that is all we're training for here and that made me stop doing things that I loved but couldn't put a finger on why I was doing them like you know I love tai chi and I also love high kicks and spinning kicks and mm. all the things that you, you that, that aren't you know aren't pragmatic or aren't practical and I don't do that anymore and I I go down my garden and I have just fun for myself to do in spinning mm. kicks on the punch bag and I do Tai Chi and I stand and I do Qigong and it's like there's no fighting involved in that it's it is precisely the art and the mm. the, the je ne sais quoi the extra thing that I I could never put my yeah. finger on my love for it yeah thank you <laughs> there's a question <laughs> then this is a let's Ty, this, this is interesting. So go, we go right back to when you were talking about nothingness and, and that kind of, uh, for me, I was taken back to 
your classroom, your seminar room in 1989. And we would go in there and there was, it was quite a big group actually, because it was a seminar, not a tutorial. We'd had a lecture on a subject and we would sit and all the chairs were round the outside of the room, I seem to remember, for some mm. reason probably because you wanted to do Tai Chi or something when we weren't there. But um, <laughs> that, never, that never occurred to me. But you would just ask a question, right? One question, <laughs> and then just sit. And if people didn't answer, you didn't feel any compulsion to go, so you know what I kind of mean is this, and have you, you would just go, so, you know, what does Roland Bart mean when he says this? And we would go, does he say that? I can't remember that shit. Did I read it? Did I read... Have we even read it? Has anyone read it? And you would just sit. And sometimes this would last for minutes on end. And as a teacher, I've never, I've never been able to do that. I've never successfully done that. Well, did you do that for a, I mean, was there a pedagogical theory? Was it informed by nothingness? Or was it just like, I'm not, I'm not singing and dancing for you. You know, what was the, do you still do that? in a classroom <laughs> um sometimes yeah especially with graduate students uh but i don't i don't think it was um anything more significant than if that in a, in a tutorial you get the chance you know you go to a lecture and somebody tells you a whole bunch of stuff and in a tutorial you get to say what you think hmm. so you know it was it was really more of an open invitation um, and as any of my students now I'm perfectly capable of talking and 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 never stops so it actually takes a lot of self-discipline not to mm. explain or not to intervene um, but I think it's important for the for people to begin to articulate their own ideas about things um, it's always going to be something slightly different. It's so I don't, I don't really have um, a terribly interesting answer to that. I just think, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's something that that is needed. You know, you've got to give space. Otherwise, people don't learn, do they? Mm. Um, you know, you can. It's like that old, that old sort of thing about. Are you the kind of teacher that's going to expect me to parrot back to you what you say or are mm. you the kind of teacher that doesn't mind if i think on my own mm. and you know I, i'm really not interested in having anybody parrot back what i say because they probably get it wrong <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. but i am interested in what they have to say always i mean i'm constantly constantly learning that's why i'm still teaching I'm a bit old to be still teaching, but I'm going to stop in a year and a half. Um, it's, but it is incredibly rewarding to uh, listen to people go through the process of picking things up. It reminds me of something else that I wanted to ask you. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, a couple of things that I picked up um, and I agree with, but I wanted you to say a bit more about is this this kind of way of romanticizing and fantasizing that a lot of these practices are somehow um, ancient mm -hmm. and you have a problem with that and I wonder what the problem was um I, I have an I have an interest in it and I, I, my interest is I mean it's connected with the idea of you know like demythologizing things which which is a bit is a bit harsh and a bit brutal. I have a, a skepticism in the face of, of of people's people's straightforward belief in the kind of timelessness and unchanging, mm. um, unbroken histories and unbroken traditions. And my problem, my problems with it are many. And and the the. On the one hand, I could go down that it's very orientalist line. It's like the, you know, we, we, we fantasize the other and everything. But I don't think that that is the ultimate problem. Uh, it always seems to me to signal someone's motivated interest, like a motivated interest in being the lineage holder, or it's connected with a nationalism. And I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of nationalism. Or it's always, it, it always seems to be connected with someone saying that they're more important and they know the truth. And, okay. and, and that's that. And it bothers me 
bothers me deeply. And I'm, I mean, I'm not a great historian and I don't look very far back in time. It's for me, it's just a, a, a kind of a skepticism and a cynicism that that's motivated by a desire to kind of deconstruct and, and expose the, the desire for power. Yeah. I mean, you could probably do the same back to me. And it's like, you know, you could say, well, yeah, you're deconstructing that so you, you can pretend you know better or something. But it bothers me. It's a kind of, it's a little kingdom building. It's, it, it, there's yeah. a lot of, it, it sets alarm bells off in my head. Mm -hmm. and, and God knows I've wanted these things to be ancient and timeless and mystical. And that's probably a large part of what drove me to Chinese martial arts mm -hmm. over all else. It was the fact that they, the belief in their ancient history and their, their direct kind of connection to some kind of transcendental universal truth, which I also half happily accept. Like I accept mm -hmm. that, you know, you can be doing Qigong or Tai Chi and you could well be in some sense doing exactly what people learned how to do many thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. But for me, there's so many ifs and buts and, and, and so what to that, that, that it, it troubles me. Yeah. yeah, the reason I asked was because I, mean, I I think it's partly because I am an historian. And yes, the primary place where I do my history at the moment is in the history of rhetoric, but I've done other historical things um, or things in history. And it's to me, it's fascinating that an embodied knowledge like these martial arts is something that goes from generation to generation and generation to generation and it never stays the same mm. um, uh, one of the things i learned from the indigenous people that i have worked with is is the way that they fully embrace that that the you know you if you go hunting with a bow and arrow you go hunting with a gun um it's there are some principles in that about how you sense landscape or animal or whatever it is you're sensing. Uh, the da a dancer would call it a felt sense. Um, the, and that's a, that's a huge area for them, the, the dancers. Um, but but the, with the, you know, the technology that you're using or the media that you're using is, is something that you're adapting to your particular circumstances and your, you know, whatever technology happens to be around or the fact that you've been brought up in a particular way or you have these relatives who are experts at this kind of thing and they've showed you how to do something so it's constantly moving on and one of the things that i find really interesting um teaching martial arts as you put it um is that the, the that kind of sense of traditions being things that continually change rather than the traditions of things that fix and empower and give you some kind of control is is fundamental to a, a mindset change that has to happen um, because otherwise you end up simply kind of passing on a set of strategies that you expect to be produced in exactly the same way and of course you as a good cultural studies person know that 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 is never going to happen um, but I guess also that I, I find it fascinating that when you look at something like um, Plato's use of gymnastic embodied practices as a way of formulating a whole series of linguistic phrases or rhetorical top um, figures like chiasmus or whatever, um, which I think he did do it that way. I think he learned from the wrestlers rather than the wrestlers were kind of just somehow there and language came along and this language for for, for the for grammar and for rhetoric came along at the same time um, and you look at somebody like Lao Tzu who's working at exactly the same time you know the 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 historical coincidences of various things that have happened is fascinating to me I don't know what to make of it but I think it's really really interesting and if you look at Greek vases and the way that people are in the British Museum, for example, and the way that people are doing push hands. <laughs> and it's just, I, I just love it. I just love it. You know, um, you, you know, they're, or they're wrestling in some kind of way uh, that is identifiable as a strategy that you can see and, 
um, a lot of the martial arts uh, that are around today. It's not so much that they are the same, it's that they have been tried and tested over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And certain things that don't work get dropped, other things that do work get retained, and then maybe they get dropped in other kinds of situations. And that kind of ebb and flow of uh, traditional knowledge and embodied knowledge, which doesn't have words a lot of the time, absolutely fascinates me. So it's not that I can't, I mean, I totally agree with you that some people use all this to claim some kind of national structure, some kind of power, some kind of leadership structure. Uh, so I was interested in, in, in hearing from you whether there was a positive side to the fact that there might be a long history for a lot of this stuff. Well, well I, th I think that I think that there are, and I accept the kind of the almost universal character of things, versions of wrestling uh, around the world. And, and mm -hmm. it, you know, it, we've got two, we tend to have two hands and two feet, as Bruce Lee said, you know, we yeah. tend to have that. Yeah. But I think what I worry about is the, it's like, you know, kind of Walter Benjamin's point about translation. We always tend to translate everything into our terms here and now. So mm -hmm. we can look at the Grecian urns and we can and, and we can look at the, the cave paintings and go, oh, look, they're doing MMA. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and it's and but but to, for it to be MMA or for it to be wrestling, mm. this, you, you know, it, it, it implies that they would share the same values and and aims and objectives and performance values and so on but i kind of prefer your image of the of the sort of wandering kind of Taoist. you can look at that history as mm -hmm. as discursive in the sense of just going in different directions that we couldn't possibly predict it's not like a teleology it's not like well mm -hmm. now we have we must have the most advanced push hands because we've been doing it for you know mm -hmm. two thousand years or something or taekwondo yeah. must be more advanced than that that to me is problematic and the alternative version of that is the version of history has declined from a golden age which so it's either we're more we're more advanced now um mm -hmm. or, or we've declined but both of them imply that a kind of historical conceptual stability that i i, I struggle with i think yeah. shifts around like like a floating island or a floating network of things mm -hmm. and it it varies in form i'm constantly trying to find a visual image that i can it, i'm always thinking of lava lamps you know in terms of the way these <laughs> have the same material i'm a child of the 70s right you know we may have the same materials but it, it it's that's what i mean by constellations and configurations and so on we can't necessarily mm -hmm. predict how the same materials will be I don't want to use the word as like assemblage, but 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 what what yeah. will be going on with that two hands and two feet? Yeah, I guess I would like to just suggest that it's 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 very interesting and it's probably quite uh, rewarding to shift that into another version of history or historicization. Um, and and if you think about something like cultural materialism, which some of the historians are really deeply embedded in now i mean that's just something that's going to change with the matter of the of your time and place mm. um as well as what you have access to but it 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 requires you to think in a different way because if, if you look at the history and you know that you can't do something exactly like somebody did 400 years ago or 2000 years ago or 5000 years ago um i think it 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 prompts you to think again it prompts you to question it prompts you to do something um, mm. that is relevant and that does have some sense of valuing for now um, so i i take i absolutely agree with everything you've said about the way that history can be used um, but being an historian i want to save some of that and save it in a rather different way because i think it's important um, I think without history, you don't have any kind of way of telling whether what you're doing is different from before. Um, I'm, I'm currently, I'm, re, I'm rethinking a lot of this in with a different set of concepts, if not, if not more historical knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. I've been, because finally, um, a lot more of Slot, Peter Sloterdijk's works have been translated from 
from German into English. And the one that I always wanted to read was his book called uh, Euro Taoismus, which was, which, uh, you know, and I always wanted, I only ever read Slavoj Žižek talking about it. And I knew that it must therefore be wrong what I was reading about it. So finally, <laughs> finally read it in, in English as infinite mobilization. I was like, ah, okay. So this is really interesting. And then reading his other works on, on like anthropotechnics and the kind of Foucauldian sort of uh, disciplinary take that he has on, on what a human is or what, what a body can do and what a person can become. And it's very interesting what he says about uh, like renaissances. He says like, you know, the European Renaissance was based on a massive imaginary connection with, 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 an, with the ancient Greeks, which was just in many senses, just wrong, but it didn't matter because it was a way of working out newness. And so right. I'm really interested in that idea and his, his claim that in the modern world, we turn to the East, we turn kind of back into the East. We think we want to go back mm -hmm. in time to a different time, but not the European prehistory or old history. We want something that isn't European because the European modernity is the problem. And so he says, that's why in, in the modern world, people turn back into the East and fantasize about it and try and think something new through it. So I'm, I'm trying to rethink all of that. So maybe this time next year, I'll have a completely different take on, on maybe I'll be defending the idea of ancient lineages and, and unbroken yeah. tradition. I don't know that lineages are that interesting it, it, for exactly the reasons that you say. But I guess I get some of that from thinking about traditional Chinese medicine, which a lot of people uh, dismiss, which I think is really, really interesting as an ex-scientist, as a continuing scientist. I think it has... Um, a lot to teach us and a lot uh, a lot of material that that western science can benefit from it goes both ways um and 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 if and as an historian specifically of the renaissance period i do know that the medicine before we get modern science and, and uh, medicine is is very similar to traditional chinese medicine um, but that's a, that's a medicinal structure that has been as far as we know because some of the earliest books are around 2500 if not more um, BCE um, it's been around for an extremely long period of time it's been keeping a large number of people pretty healthy um, and it's and it's it's got many different forms but there are certain basic underlying structures uh, like the meridians for example um, that uh, have continued to give people anchor points to move on from and uh, sometimes I feel that the practices in martial arts or the kind of whole body breathing practices uh, or internal martial arts or whatever you want to call them um, they there are anchor points because the Bruce Lee we've all got two hands and two feet mm -hmm. um, and these anchor points are, are are places for us to maybe journey out from but they're there and you can always go back to them and uh, and question and discover and journey and wander mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's um that's a very interesting way of thinking about it and i will i will think about that and i um, i'm i'm conscious of the time yes sorry um, but i think it, i think that it, it's a brilliant place to leave it with you having kind of tied me up into some kind of uh, rear naked choke or half nelson or something that i have to go oh hang on this is a cliffhanger okay so uh, <laughs> good stuff thank you so much well no thank you thank you for um for getting up so early uh in the morning and and taking the time to speak to me after all this time so um okay professor lynette hunter thank you very much Thank you.